Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. And welcome in to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that in the 18-teens and 20s, the instability in Europe and the newly won independence in Mexico led to an increase in American immigration into Texas? And that the American immigrants who traveled into Texas had to convert to Catholicism give up their slaves, and speak Spanish? And that the Mexican government had initially invited Americans into the region to provide the Mexican government with and the Mexican people with a buffer from Native American raids. That actually was the birth of the Texas Rangers, too. That's what prompted that. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 131, a story about Texas. All right, everyone, welcome into episode 131, and we're just going to dive right into it. So, last episode, we wrapped up with the election of 1836 and saw Andrew Jackson's hand-picked successor, Martin Van Buren, win the election and become our president-elect. There will be some important things to cover in Van Buren's presidency, and I am looking forward to doing so. But as I mentioned at the episode, uh, at the end of episode 130, we'll be doing that after we finish talking about the Texas Revolution. And that will be the topic for the next few episodes, diving deeper into this revolution, which was fought against Mexico primarily by Americans. The Texas Revolution lasted from the fall of 1835 to the spring of 1836, so it was all happening toward the end of Andrew Jackson's presidency. As you can imagine, the Republic of Texas, and whether or not it would be admitted uh, to the U.S. as a state, was a pretty hot-button topic immediately. And for the next 10 years, it will be constantly discussed by some in Washington, D.C., and create some significant tension, things we'll be diving more into detail about in a future episode. So, with all of that said, let's take a look at what was going on down south so we can have a better understanding of how it all plays into the larger context of American history. But before we get into details about the Texas Revolution itself, I think it would be valuable to spend some time giving you some more information about Mexico so you can get a better idea of why the Texans or Tejanos or Texians revolted in the first place. So, let's start with the Spanish Empire. Now, the colony of New Spain, which of course began with the expeditions of Hernan Cortes in the early 1500s, or Hernando Cortes, whichever one you'd like to use in reference to him, and then it just expanded from there. New Spain was huge. It covered land all the way from present-day southwest Canada, all of the land west of the Mississippi in present-day United States, all of Florida, islands in the Caribbean, and the land all the way down to Costa Rica. I mean, it was it's really just incredible just how big this was. Oh, and did I mention at one point it also included the Philippines on the other side of the Pacific Ocean? In 1535, as the territory grew more and more, it was turned into a viceroyalty. This was governed by a viceroy, with distinctly separate provinces governed each by a governor. And by the way, a viceroy is someone who rules in the name of a king. It's combining the 
terms vice and roy, roy obviously being short for royal or royalty. So New Spain was enormous, and technically the viceroy was expected to be able to set up a proper bureaucracy that would allow him to govern all of the land. Now, the governmental system in New Spain was actually pretty complicated and ever-changing. Unsurprisingly, we will not be getting into all of that here. But the viceroy ruled out of central Mexico, in Mexico City, formerly the native city of Tenochtitlan. Now, at the time of Mexican independence, there was a very clear caste system in New Spain, including the Peninsulares, Criollos, uh, Indios, Mestizos, Mul- uh, mulatos and negros. This caste system primarily revolved around how much European descent you were, more or less. And quick to note, the negros, as you could have guessed probably, were people of purely African descent. So yes, New Spain had slavery and they had a lot of it in some areas. Now, Spain was a Catholic country, and at this time, the church had incredible power. It was no different in New Spain. There was widespread conversions in New Spain of native peoples, primarily in present-day Mexico, and the people of New Spain became avid Catholics, so much so that the church establishment had a ton of power and influence over the people of New Spain. During the second half of the 18th century, the Bourbon family, which was ruling the Spanish Empire at the time, determined that England and France were a hell of a lot better at this whole colonialism thing than they were, and they wanted to make some money too. The system they had set up just wasn't as profitable as it could have been. So, they put some reforms in place that were pretty drastic in a lot of ways and upset the apple cart. Without getting into too much detail, since this is a U.S. history podcast, uh, they were primarily aimed at bringing more direct control and authority of the colonies under the crown, and in turn, weakening the control and influence of the Catholic Church. But the effect was different than the intent. The Peninsulares, who were at the top of this caste system, actually gained more power through the process, creating increased resentment from the rest of the classes of the people in New Spain. When Napoleon launched his peninsular war against Spain, ran roughshod over the country, and got their king to abdicate the throne in 1808, things began to change. As you could likely imagine, people over on the other side of the Atlantic were like, um, if there isn't a king of Spain anymore, then who is ruling us again? On top of this, there was also a war for independence going on in Spain at the same time. Stuff gets a little complicated. Anyway, Napoleon took over Spain in 1808. And when he did that, there were a small handful of junta governments that popped up uh, over the country claiming that they were the new official government of Spain. So they sent representatives over to New Spain asking for recognition. And it was at this point that the people of New Spain realized, hold on a second, there is no one controlling us anymore. So the competing political factions in New Spain argued with each other about what should happen next. With the Peninsulares afraid of some Criollo, and they were like, Criollos were like one step below the Peninsulares. The Peninsulares were afraid of some Criollo uh, rebellion that would threaten their power. Because of course, when you're on top of the pyramid of power, you're always worried about who the next threat will be. Eventually, one of the juntas rose to power in Spain a couple years later and sent one of their guys to New Spain as the viceroy, and things seemed to calm down a bit. Well, the lower classes in New Spain were mm, beyond frustrated with how the Peninsulares had been acting in very questionable ways the last couple years, seeing as how there's a huge power vacuum, many of them have stepped into it. Um, This also included uh, arresting the former viceroy who sympathized with the Corellios on trumped-up charges. The powder keg in New Spain, and specifically present-day Mexico, was about to explode. Just two days after the new viceroy from Spain took office, a revolutionary movement took over in Mexico, marching through the country and murdering any peninsulares they came across. Miguel Hidalgo led this specific insurrection in 1810, and it was unfortunately eventually, well, unfortunately for him, eventually crushed by the royal army. 
but his early success motivated numerous other men to lead uprisings all over the country. The problem? Well, all these different guys weren't united. So for the next 10 years, there were uprisings all over the country uh, that the royal army kept putting down. So a decade later, the Mexican insurgents were losing steam and momentum. It seemed like some type of realized independence just wasn't going to happen. Enter Augustin Iturbide. Iturbide was a general who had actually been leading the royal forces against the insurgencies for the last 10 years. But 1820 was a year of revolts in the mother country, Spain, and was threatening the monarchy. Iturbide, who at heart was really conservative, feared that this wave of revolution in Europe would eventually reach Mexico and lead to his nightmare, a Republican government like America. So, in order to try to prevent that, he actually switched sides, sort of. Iturbide met up with Vincente Guerrero, the leader of the liberal army, and they agreed on a plan that was called the Three Guarantees. This combined the desires of the liberals and the conservatives with freedom from Spain, supremacy of the Catholic Church, and the elimination of the caste system, so all people would be equal. That was their platform. With such a broad platform, this new unexpected coalition appealed to pretty much everyone in Mexico. So this combined army then marched on Mexico City with no real opponent and had overwhelming support. The royals then saw the writing on the wall and shipped out of Mexico, handing over the land to the people. Now, Guerrero and Iturbide had agreed that if a monarch from Europe was interested in running Mexico as an independent country, they would take him. But no one offered. So in 1822, Iturbide was crowned as Emperor of Mexico, but he immediately ran into trouble. Slave owners were furious that the caste system was destroyed, which meant slavery was uh, very limited and much more difficult. Later, seven years later, slavery will be uh, totally abolished in Mexico. The royalists were angry that it was a constitutional monarchy, not a royal monarchy. Also, if the royalists were going to be ruled under a monarch, it was going to be a European one, not a Mexican one. Lastly, as you could likely imagine, the Republicans just weren't happy in general, seeing as how it wasn't a republic. It was a constitutional monarchy. One year later, Iturbite was overthrown and exiled to Italy. With Iturbide gone, the extreme liberals and conservatives were at each other's throats, even with some factions within the Republican and Royalists breaking up. Countries like Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador all broke away in the same year in 1821, declaring their independence too. With all this chaos in Mexico, many wealthy peninsulares and criollos left and took their wealth with them crippling Mexico and its economy on the world stage. Eventually, Iturbide was lured back to Mexico to try to right the ship in 1824, but he didn't have the same support he used to, and the Republicans wanted him gone. Immediately. Iturbide was executed just days after he arrived in July of 1824. For the next decade leading up to the Texas Revolution, Mexico continued to be disunited, fractured, and lacking a strong central authority, which, of course, made it easier for the Texas Revolution to happen in the first place. Now, you may be wondering, man, we just spent a lot of time talking about a revolution that really didn't have anything to do with the U.S. What gives? Well, in order for us to grapple with the realities that many Americans were facing in Tejas or Texas, it's important to have an appreciation of what Mexico had just accomplished in their freedom from Spain, while also understanding why Mexico was as weak and ineffective as we will find them to be. Now, the history of the U.S. and Spain certainly comes into play here, too. We all know about the sanctioned expeditions into Florida that eventually led the U.S. to pry it away from the Spanish Empire through the adams oni Treaty, but the unofficial expeditions into Spanish land were even more intriguing and, for Spain and then Mexico, worrisome. And don't forget that this treaty, in which we got Florida, uh, signed in 1819, the adams oni Treaty, gave up all U.S. claims to Texas, 
which is why many Southerners were frustrated by what they perceived as John Quincy Adams' inability to strike a better deal. These unofficial expeditions into Spanish land, which I mentioned just a moment ago, were known as filibusters. And no, it technically doesn't have anything to do with the political filibuster in Congress, although that is actually where the name came from. These military filibusters saw men, without authorization, head into Spanish territories trying to drum up rebellion for a specific reason, with the reason usually being that they would then profit from it, of course. Some of the more well-known examples are Aaron Burr in Texas, George Rogers Clark in Louisiana and Mississippi, and William Walker in Mexico and Nicaragua. Now, were these expeditions in which the men just like gathered up a bunch of guys and a bunch of guns and headed into Spanish territory to drum up some type of uprising or revolt? Were they legal? No. Were they tacitly supported by the U.S. government? Eh. Sort of, yeah. Now, on top of this, we know that the U.S. bought Louisiana in 1803 under the Jefferson administration, or at least I hope you remember that. While most agreed that present-day Texas wasn't part of the Louisiana Purchase, which is why Adams negotiated it out in 1819, many Americans, like Andrew Jackson, thought that the Texas Territory did still rightfully belong to the U.S., and the U.S. had just failed to act on that right. So we have a country with a history of filibustering into Spanish lands to drum up trouble, while also simultaneously having a portion of their population believing that Texas rightfully belonged to them, and I'm sure you can sort of put two and two together here. Oh, and if you can, you aren't the only one. In Ed Bradley's book, We Never Retreat, Filibustering Expeditions into Spanish Texas, he points out very quickly, in chapter 1, in fact, just how big of a worry this was to Spanish officials in Texas, with one of them writing that, quote, The United States have purchased Louisiana from France, and if they succeed in establishing themselves on the limits of Texas, God keep us from their hands. The U.S. government is the most ambitious, restless, unsteady, caviling, and meddlesome government on earth. That's pretty harsh. Then again, we are really ambitious and restless, and we have definitely done and continue to do our fair share of meddling. Anyway, to be fair to the U.S. government, in 1806, just to make sure that this didn't happen, like to make sure it was all on the up and up, and this didn't create some type of conflict with Spain, remember it was still Spain at the time in 1806, the U.S. government actually created a zone of neutrality in between the Louisiana Purchase and the Texas Territory that so many Americans pined after, just to make sure that officially, no meddling. Officially. But, of course, that didn't stop the filibusters from gallivanting wherever they pleased. Now, the first major attempt to take Texas as in, to make it an independent republic first started in 1812, because of an American filibuster that ended badly. Known as the Gutierrez-McGee expedition, this saw the usurpers, a mixture of American filibusters and Spanish Republicans, take over a handful of cities and declare independence for the state of Texas as part of the Mexican Republic in 1813. But this didn't last long, as they fell to the Spanish army at the Battle of Medina, the single bloodiest battle in Texas history, in August of 1813. 1,300 of the 1,400 men fighting for Texas independence fell in that battle, and to make matters worse, the Spanish officials then captured and executed 300 more Republican officials from nearby San Antonio. And one thing that is also important to note, uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, who will later fight the Texans as head of the Mexican army, was part of that massacre. But the Battle of Medina left an indelible memory in the minds of many Americans, and most wanted nothing to do with Texas, understandably, at least in the short term. Which is why Adams was willing to agree in the adams O'Neill Treaty seven years later that the U.S. would keep their hands off it. But, as you can imagine, that did not stop the filibustering. That same year, in 1819, James Long, Jim Bowie, and the famous pirate from New Orleans, Jean Lafitte, took another expedition into Texas. But this was a spectacular failure, too. 
and that was the last filibuster into Texas. As we have already covered, Mexico gained their independence two years later, which pretty much changed everything, because now a brand new government owned the area of Texas. And almost immediately after their independence from Spain, Mexico had some problems. This land to the north, in what is present-day Texas and other states in the southwest, was constantly being raided by Native Americans that had been previously quelled, at least sort of, by the Spanish Royal Army, or at least the threat of it. Well, when Mexico became a republic in 1824, they were all of a sudden, understandably, interested in finding a solution to this problem. They combined the provinces of Texas and Coahuila and created the state of Coahuila y Tejas. And then we are introduced to Moses Austin. Austin, an American, had received a land grant in Texas while it was still under Spanish rule. He was actually the only person to receive such a grant. But he had never acted on it due to the Mexican War for Independence and everything going a little crazy down there. And then he died. After his death, his son, who you may have heard of, Stephen F. Austin, did act on it. Austin, Stephen, that is, traveled to Texas in order to cash in on his father's land grant. Now, Mexico had set up something called the Empresario system. Empresario was Spanish for entrepreneur. These empresarios would have the right to settle on a large piece of land if they recruited other people to that land and took responsibility for continuing the settlement of it. In 1823, after Austin had taken over his father's empresarial contract, Mexico required all empresarios to recruit at least 200 other families into the area of East Texas. The next year, the Mexican government relaxed the rules on immigration to Texas even further, and with the Panic of 1819 still having people down on their luck, Americans began to flood in. But like most things in life, there was a catch. These American immigrants were now living in Mexico, and in Mexico, you needed to be Catholic and speak Spanish. The Mexican government required these new American immigrants to do the same. On top of that, they had to document their immigration with Mexican authorities, too. Now, this lax immigration policy by Mexico was purposeful. The land to the north of Mexico, like the land of Texas, was under constant attacks and raids by Native American tribes in the region. With having land that was so sparsely populated in the northern part of their country, the Mexican government recognized that they did not have the ability to do anything about these raids, which is why they opened it up to so much more immigration and implemented the empresario system in the first place. They figured if they could get Americans to move into the region and recruit others to do so, while also converting to Catholicism and learning Spanish— they will be able to populate this region and have generations of Mexicans in the future to protect this land. Well, this was not a good idea, as I'm sure you had already guessed. These Americans in Texas were armed and dangerous, and they felt like they needed to be in order to fight off the Comanche raids that they experienced. This is actually why the Texas Rangers existed in the first place. Like the actual Texas Rangers, not the baseball team. Then, in 1829, the Mexican government abolished slavery, mandating that all American immigrants in Texas were not allowed to own slaves anymore, and any future immigrants to Texas couldn't bring theirs with them. So now we have a population of people in Texas that identify as American, were forced to convert to Catholicism, speak Spanish, and get rid of their slaves? I don't think so. But Mexico doubled down. They implemented the laws of April 6, 1830, which prohibited further immigration to Texas, increased taxes, and reiterated the ban on slavery, just in case any Texians have forgotten about it. And a Texian is an English-speaking Texan, by the way. So pretty much they are Texans of American descent. But the Texians refused to abide by these laws, continuing to emigrate to Texas and bringing their slaves with them. 
A few years later, in 1832, Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, remember I mentioned him a few moments ago from the Battle of Medina and the ensuing massacre? Well, he overthrew the Mexican government. With Mexico currently dealing with a coup of their government, the Texians decided they were going to expel the Mexican forces in Texas, freeing themselves up to operate and live how they pleased, which is exactly what they did. Riding high on their success, the Texians then started tossing around ideas of independence, holding two political conventions in 1830. To assuage the concerns of the Texians and to get them to chill out a little bit, the Mexican government, now led by Santa Ana, increased their representation in the state legislature and eased up on some of the restrictions. At least initially, it seemed like the problem was solved, with Stephen F. Austin remarking that, quote, Every evil complained of has been remedied. But even with their concerns temporarily satisfied, Mexican officials kept a watchful eye on the Texians, afraid that it might just be a matter of time until they were heard from again. Back in Mexico City, which, just for context of all of this stuff, is about a thousand miles from central Texas, so you can see why governing this area effectively was challenging. Anyway, back in Mexico City, Santa Ana was working to remake the government of Mexico for what suited him best, which was to centralize power and get rid of the Republican Constitution, which he did in 1835. He dismissed the state legislatures and disbanded the militias. Furious over this unrepentant power grab, citizens took up arms in various places, inevitably being crushed by Mexican forces, with Santa Ana being particularly ruthless, again, in the state of Zacatecas, really hope I pronounced that correctly, pillaging the city and killing over 2,000 of his own Mexican citizens. All of this, once again, drummed up intense debate in Texas over their fate and their future in Mexico. The United States began to editorialize about why Texas obviously needed to be free, and President Andrew Jackson was reaching out to see if there's any way he could buy it from Mexico. And keep in mind, Jackson reached out a few different times about this, and before that, John Quincy Adams had tried to buy Texas from Mexico. So, to figure out where everyone stood, the Texians decided that they would convene a provisional government that would meet in October of 1835, known as the Consultation. Santa Ana was in a tough spot. Not that I feel bad for him. He knew that Mexico was not prepared or equipped to fight a full-blown civil war. He also knew that Texas revolting was one thing. But what if the Coahuila joined them or the neighboring territories of Nuevo Mexico or Alta California? Santa Ana knew something needed to be done, and quickly. He needed to nip this uprising in the bud and stop the spread of American influence as soon as he possibly could. So, in early September 1835, Santa Ana sent his brother-in-law, General Martin Perfecto de Cos, to lead 500 soldiers to Texas to quell any potential rebellion. And that is where we will leave off this week. The Texians are fed up with having to listen to Santa Ana and the Mexican government and it's all going to boil over next episode in October of 1835 as we officially begin the Texas Revolution. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. A Teacher's History of the United States is supported by its fans at patreon.com slash a teacher's history. Those of you who are able to contribute, I can't thank you enough as it keeps this podcast going and allows me to continue to make time to try to provide you with the most in-depth and comprehensive history of our nation that I possibly can. A sincere thank you to all of our patrons in general, and specifically the ones at the teacher's pet level, with our newest being Andrew Lindemann, and history nerd level, who helped to sponsor the show. Their names can be found on our website at aTeachersHistory.com. And a super special thanks to our patrons at that history nerd level. We couldn't do the show without you. Our newest, Krista Sandstad, Rita Huckle, Tammy Smith, Norm McLaughlin, and Pamela Caldwell. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>